All right, so we're going to have a lesson today on operating systems, but um, what do you call it? We're going to go over, uh, do you think, I don't know, actually, maybe we not break your out room today. Maybe that's next time, right? Okay, so we'll go over the weekly challenge, and then we'll go into operating systems. Um, yeah, I think next meeting, or I don't know, next meeting, we're going to try to get a feel for, you know, um, what you guys are expecting out of this club because uh, we don't want to bring top-notch quality content. So we might have a breakout room next meeting. You can tell your friends too, if they're interested. And we'll be like hearing from what you guys kind of want to see uh, this club do. Also, by, Sorry by, the, way, oh, by the way, um, so this, we're still in our first fundamental, we're, we're in the fundamental sections of our, our meeting plan. So. It, it might be boring because we want to, you know, give you a better, you know, um, basic understanding of um, the computers and, and stuff around you. So, yeah. And then in the next few sections, we'll, you know, uh, introduce more interesting hands-on stuff like um, CTFs. And um, in the, you know, uh, later in the year, we'll do some pen testing as well. So, yeah, it's going to be fun as long as, you know, keep, keep coming to our club meetings. And also, if you have any um, thoughts or if you just want to support our club, please fill out the survey in our um, um, Discord announcement uh, channel. Yeah, it's it's a short survey, so it's like a feedback form. Okay, I'm done. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I think that's everybody. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, our lesson will be on operating systems, but first we'll do a Walk through the challenges. Wait, am I gonna be sharing screen for walk through challenges? Oh, uh, the questions are already on the side. So. Oh, nice. Um, so basically, the the, uh, the weekly challenge is mostly like assembly and stuff. And um, so the first one, the first question is, what is the last instruction in a function in um, x86 assembly? So, uh. So if you've done programming, you probably know what a function is, and you know that. Um, so basically, a um, so in the main method or something equivalent to that in other programming languages, you know you can call another function to enter that function, and when it's done, the function ha can return some value, or it can just simply just return nothing and just go back to the um, um, the original function that called this this uh, function. So. So basically, the last instruction will always be this uh, ret um, instruction ret. It either returns some value or, or it actually does. You just if you want to return some value, you just move the the value you want to return into the eax register or r or rax, and um, and then the return instruction just you know go goes back to the to where you called it, yeah, and. Um, the next question, what is the relationship between um, the assembly language and machine code? So the assembly language, um, it's like, uh, it's basically mnemonics for the machine code. And it's going to be different for uh, each different um, CPUs or uh, ISA, instruction set architecture. So for different ISA, they have different instructions. So they have slightly varied assembly languages and for like, and um, so the assembly language is simply, um, so if you have like, let's say some kind of binary, um, uh, so if you have an instruction in binary in machine code, the assembly language simply is simply the, a textual representation. So it makes you, it makes it human readable. Yeah. And why do people still use, still use assembly today when we have access to languages like Python? So uh, assembly, it's like very low level. It um, you have direct access to everything like the CPU and stuff, so you can you can write. Um, so if you want to like efficient it, I mean I mean um, make something like more efficient, use assembly. But uh, but that's for like very specific circ circumstances. So um, uh, so for other for other situations, you can you can use high level programming languages like C or um, uh, C++ or Python, Java. And um, assembly are, is also used when you want to compile something because um, you cannot just simply um, convert a uh, 
high level program language into the machine code. So you have to translate it to assembly first and then and then um, the assembly can be directly translated to machine code. And three, where I mean, and four, uh, write an instruction in assembly that will set the value of register RBX to the value stored at the memory address stored in RCX. And, uh, we, and then, um, so basically to, to set a value of a register or some memory, you use a, a move instruction. And then the second part, uh, so you, you want to set the, you want to set RBX to something. And then um, the second, the value is, sorry. yeah, so basically use MOV, yes, space, and then RBX, that's the left side, basically, um, yeah, and then, and then comma. Yeah, and then space. <laughs> And then I said that uh, we wanted the uh, value stored at the memory address stored in RCX. So you basically, you first you want to get the memory address at RCX. So you type RCX. Yeah, so that's the, that's, that's the memory address and it's stored in RCX. And then you want to use, you want to use the value stored at the, uh, stored at the address stored in RCX. So you put the square brackets around it yeah, to actually use that address. So now um, you can, um, so now it's basically doing RBX equals um, something, something stored in the memory address at RCX. This, this is very confusing. So we'll cover it later in binary exploitation. So stay tuned for the later section here. Yeah, all right. Uh, so now we're gonna get into today's lesson, starting off with what is an operating system? Now, Google defines it as the software that supports a computer's basic functions, such as scheduling tasks, executing applications, and controlling peripherals. Uh, so basically, the OS is a program that opens other programs and tells the computer hardware uh, to allocate the right amount of memory or storage or the right amount of time that each program gets to interact with the CPU. Uh, and the OS basically makes sure that all of this goes smoothly because otherwise things would be a mess or just plainly inefficient. Uh, it's like the manager. You can think of it as the manager. Now, they usually come pre-installed on your computers. I think we all know this. Uh, Mac, Windows, Linux. Uh, and modern ones are extremely useful because they make things very easy for the user to interact with the computer because uh, the user simply needs to tell the OS what they want the computer to do. And then the computer will, uh, sorry, then the OS will just explain to the CPU and firmware and such to do what they need to do. And so because of this, it's extremely user-friendly and really is exactly what people think of when they hear the word computer. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the evolution of operating systems. Um, so basically, uh, the evolution of operating systems started in the 1950s with serial processing. Um, basically, serial processing is a process where the instructions are performed in a first in first out or FIFO manner. And they were used on punch cards because at that time there was no like real operating systems yet. Um, because of the punch cards, um, people who wanted to run a program had to manually like hard code it into the punch card first and then just run the program and then they'll see the output. And there was no ability for any like user interaction. And then next up, we have the batch system. So it's a bit similar, except the main difference and advantage is that you were able to batch to get batch together similar jobs. And basically the similar jobs would be um, executed at the same time, which would like be a bit more efficient. And then we have the multi-programming batch system, which executes programs with a single processor, um, normally something like a CPU. So that's more similar to the things we are seeing today. And then next slide. And then the last three we have are the time-shared OS, the parallel system, and the distributed system. So the time-shared OS is basically, a, it's like a multitasking basically, because you can have a job scheduler. What that means is you know, the CPU um, is able to switch between different processes 
and it can share its time between different processes, which is basically kind of like CPU utilization, which made it even more efficient. And then we had a parallel system, which is where you can have multiple network, multiple computers um, connected via a network. And basically you can increase your num the number of processors or CPUs to get more work done in a shorter period of time by distributing like the loads between the different computers. And then lastly, we have the distributed operating system, which is able to share resources between different sites via high speed buses. Um, so basically you can just imagine it as like, for example, if site one is able to do blank, site two can like grab that information from site one, which is basically like kind of what we're doing today. And if a resource or system fails in one site due to like technical problems, we can use the other systems resources in some of the other sites. Um, basically, if you didn't understand of any of this stuff about the evolution of operating system, just the main thing to remember and take away is that operating systems have advanced a long way from the 1950s when it was just serial processing with punch cards. Um, and now I'm going to be talking about the kernel. Um, so the kernel uh, basically is a core component of an operating system and of each operating system. What it does is it has complete control over everything in the OS. Um, you might know that it powers on immediately and it's actually powered on by the bootloader. So for example, the BIOS performs <clears throat> a power on self test or a, PL, uh, or a post. And by doing that, it initializes devices and it also powers on a bunch of different things, which I'm not gonna get into, but basically at the end of its power on, the kernel is up and running. Um, the kernel is also a low level abstraction layer, which basically means that it works with the more simple things such as um, allocating the CPUs um, like time and all of the memory to the various um, applications and it kind of connect, connects the application software to the hardware of a computer. And it's also responsible for running and executing various programs. Um, so to backtrack a, a bit about the powering on of the bootloader, um, basically to summarize it, the order is BIOS to bootloader to kernel um, to initialization. So that's basically like a summary. And um, all in all, basically what a, what a kernel is, it's simply a core component of the operating system and it um, communicates between interprocesses and system calls and it acts as a bridge between applications and data processing, which was performed at a hardware level. Okay, so earlier, um, earlier we talked about processes and how um, the OS is able to manage it. So basically, when you when you want to run a program, when you want to start something like Chrome, you you click on it, and then and then the OS um, notified uh, gets notified, and then uh, tries to it tells CPU, hey, we we have a program, and this program this this running program is called a process, and so um, a process can also have threads. Um, they're basically stuff that a process wants to do like simultaneously. Um, like, um, so these, these two things don't overlap each other. They, they can be separated and done uh, in parallel. And so if, if, if uh, we have threads, then we can improve its efficiency by doing them at the same time. And so the, the reason why we need um, purposes is that we can you know, uh, distinguish different tasks um, like if you want to run Chrome and Word um, together, you don't have to run them one by one and just start them. And then the OS can, um, if it's if it has uh, if it uh, it's if it implemented like you know um, if it's a modern OS, it, it can probably handle processes and run these together and then use the use like CPU and then do like some context switching and stuff. And yeah, and that's basically um, in uh, processes and. It's an abstraction that enables multitasking. So, wait, <clears throat> wait uh, yeah. So if you have processes, you can also prioritize them. Um, so if, if one thing, uh, if, so if the kernel wants to do something, it probably has higher prioritization. If, if you know, the user is trying to process some file in the background, you can move it to a lower um, prioritization. So if, uh, so, so it, it might take, 
so it doesn't take too much CPU as to you know break uh, as you freeze your whole computer, and um, and um, processes also makes it uh, easier to you know uh, manage stuff. So if you have you know task manager on Windows, you can just click on one of these processes and then kill it or view its information and stuff. And um, one one thing that processes also enables you to do is it's that it isolates different stuff. So you don't want your you don't want Word, Office Word, to be able to see what tabs you have in Chrome. So um, the OS has to separate them, and um, and uh, like uh, so the so by separating them by separating them, I mean they can't they cannot access each other's memory. So they have a separate memory address space, which we'll talk about later. But you, you probably get what it means. They, yeah, and um, um, and then lastly, processes also uh, can also do privilege separation. So, so at the beginning of so when you boot up the OS, uh, uh, so let's say you have you are on Linux, and then Linux has uh, the first process. Uh, Linux. Uh, so uh, let me restart. So after you boot up the OS, um, so it will create the first process, and then this first process has the highest privilege, and so it wants to start start off other things like some system services or your you know um, user interface and stuff. So it creates new processes and then. It grants like lower privileges to these stuff so, so that they only do the things that they are allowed to do. And these processes do the same thing. They they allow you to start programs or do some other stuff, and then only delegate, only um use the right um privilege on, uh yeah, only separate the like correct privilege on these lower processes. Yeah. All right. Now, you've probably heard of the terms application and service. And since most of us don't really know the difference, we are here to clarify that. So applications are things that the user actually interacts with. They're typically the stuff you spend all your time on, like Visual Studio Code, Firefox, uh, Word documents. Those are all applications. Meanwhile, services run on the background. They don't open their own graphical user interfaces. Users don't interact with them. Uh, and some of them even run as soon as the operating system boots up. Uh, like for example, antivirus softwares, they run when the user isn't even logged in. It's in the background completely. Uh, and have you ever wondered how a game or Windows itself checks for updates? Uh, well, they do this with services. And services are usually used to help the computer and other applications run smoothly. And admittedly, they aren't as fun or flashy as applications. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that, you'll see in the top right corner, that one's kind of a worser diagram. <laughs> we'll get to the bottom left in a second. But in the top right corner, you kind of see of a rough summary of the kind of services you have, like uh, device services, networking services. All of this helps programs and the computer interact with each other and other computers. And if you look in the bottom left corner uh, on the image on the left, you'll see that uh, you have some applications open, like a task manager, Scorpio.exe. Those are all things you interact with. And then on the right, you see services that help them run. Uh, like let's look at Bluetooth support service. That allows your computer to use Bluetooth. Auto time zone updater. That means that you're, uh, well, I mean, it's pretty obvious. So applications you interact with, services applica services are the programs that the applications use to be able to run smoothly and provide the user with what they need. Uh, so, all operating systems have uh, file systems, and a file system is a structured organization of data on some type of storage device. So all file systems have a few attributes. First of all, it has some type of a data storage, which is the primary function of any file system. Basically, it's to be a structured place to store and retrieve data. It also has a naming and organizational method that provides rules for naming and structuring data. And it has some kind of a security model, a scheme for defining access rights. So files stored in file systems are just sequences of bits and bytes 
whose meaning is defined by the user. In addition to the user's files, the file system also contains its own parameters, such as block size, file descriptors, such as file size, file location, etc., cetera, uh, file names, directory, hierarchy. It may also store some kind of security information and other parameters. So here are some common types of file systems that we use today. FAT32, which stands for File Allocation Table, is popular due to its high level of compatibility across operating systems. Because of its small file size limit and its flexibility across different operating systems, it's most often used to format USB flash drives, memory cards, and other types of external storage devices. NTFS stands for New Technology File System. It was introduced to overcome limitations of FAT32 and it has a much larger file size limit. Basically, it effectively uh, did away with the file size constraints. It also has a journaling file system, which means it maintains a record of changes so it can recover after a system crash. Unlike FAT32, it also supports file permissions such as having a file that is flagged read only. Also some kind of a encryption along with other features which make it more suitable to use than FAT32 on a system drive. For these reasons, modern versions of Windows are installed on a drive with NTFS formatted. However, it has limited non-Windows compatibility, uh, meaning it's not supported in Linux and Mac OS nearly as much. EXT4, which stands for Extended File System, is the default file system for Linux. Compared to its predecessors, EXT1, 2, and 3, it has a larger file system support, improved, res uh, improved resistance to fragmentation, higher performance, and improved time spans. Basically, many of the features that NTFS has, if not anymore. And it also has limited Windows and Mac OS support. So in general, system drives use NTFS file systems for Windows and EXT4 for Linux. FAT32 is used for memory cards, USB drives, and basically any other external storage devices. All right, so now we're gonna be talking on the, since we talked a lot about operating systems, we'll get into some common operating systems today, Windows and Linux, and we'll briefly go over Mac too. And so uh, Windows was a, we'll do kind of what they are, and then we'll do a comparison between the two. And so Windows was a graphical user interface, a GUI, uh, operating system that was introduced in by Microsoft in 1985 with very early versions of uh, window, Windows like uh, Microsoft NT or NT and things like that. And so they built their kernel on MS-DOS. And so uh, it was used for mainly uh, Intel processors, but any other x86 processor would work as well. And so uh, nowadays, it has it used to only have 32-bit systems, operating systems, but now it's 64-bit. Uh, if you're wondering what 32-bit or 64-bit is, it's basically uh, how your, your processor is basically structured. You can kind of check uh, if your computer is 32 or 64-bit by going into like your system information. And so 32-bit came uh, earlier and 64-bit came a while after, after the technology improved. And neat thing about 64-bit operating systems is usually they can also support 32-bit software and files and programs and whatnot. And so Windows was written in C, C++, and C++, C Sharp, and Assembly. So pretty low-level languages. And it was considered kind of this personal computer where it was in every household and, you know, a lot of people had access to it. <clears throat> Okay, so moving on to Linux. Linux was introduced six years later in 1991 by Linus Torvalds and is more geared towards being a command line interface with, uh, although Windows has things like, or actually when Windows was introduced, it was also command line, but Windows really kind of went forward with trying to develop uh, friendly user interfaces at, like we'll talk about in the future, or like just now, or in like in a couple minutes. And uh, although both of them are GUI now, uh, Linux uses a lot more of its shell, and um, you don't see you you don't use uh, Windows command prompt as often as a Linux user would use Linux is shell. And so Linux was a Unix-like kernel. We'll talk about what Unix is and 
a kind of development of operating systems into their different branches. And it is also formed with GNU, uh, which is uh, kind of what it builds off the Linux kernel and it kind of offers the functionality to a user. And so uh, Linux also has distributions and basically distributions are different types of operating systems uh, built for different purposes. And so you have things like Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, and you have stuff like uh, in backend servers like Ubuntu server. And Linux is also both 64 and 32 bit and it's just written in C and assembly. All right, so for Windows, uh, Windows, uh, we're kind of doing a comparison now. So Windows is uh, more of graphical user interface and it's more user friendly. And uh, Linux, Linux is less user friendly, but it can be a lot more powerful at times. And you need kind of it. You kind of need more of an in-depth knowledge of computer science and things like that in general to use Linux. And so Windows is widespread uh, in the sense that it's used in enterprise networks like um, like big companies and businesses and also use in homes, a uh, personal computer. While well, Linux is actually it takes a majority in the servers of these networks. So uh, if you ever had to connect to some kind of a website and do some kind of, I don't know, you might have to search a database or something. You probably have to access a Linux server sometime, like definitely uh, access this Linux server at some time. And it's for like kind of, uh, if you go on a website or maybe a game even, like games you might play, their game servers might be, or most likely are Linux. And so yeah, they also, Linux is also used in smartphones, like your Android phone is actually a built off Linux. And they're also using cloud computing. So when you connect to the cloud <coughs> and also for supercomputers. So those are relatively new, but a lot of supercomputers are built off Linux. And so Windows uh, also has a subsystem for Linux where you can actually run Windows or Linux in Windows. And that's been introduced in the past two years. And basically you run Linux in Windows. And yeah, so that's kind of the comparison. Uh, for Macs, uh, we don't talk about them much because they have a kind of like a lesser, they're lesser in the like in the in the field in the view of cybersecurity. They don't show up as much, but they still be they're still used and they're more similar to Linux than Windows, but they're not Linux. And uh, we'll go into that next slide, or I think there's gonna be a comparison for a bunch of branches later. All right, so uh, talking about these operating systems, uh, we have something that uh, in each operating system, regardless of Windows, Linux, or Mac, or even something else, they all usually have users. And so uh, here's a picture of Windows users, so users in groups. And basically in every operating, this is kind of more towards operating systems, so it's kind of like a sidetrack. But here you can see that there's uh, there's uh, groups, there's users, and then here's the groups, and there's a bunch of groups. And we'll be doing this stuff kind of, the kind of stuff in Cyber Patriot, securing this stuff. So if you guys are interested in Cyber Patriot, we'll be doing this kind of stuff. And so uh, you have like administrators here and that's pulled up here and then you have just regular users and then you have a variety of other users that usually aren't actual uh, people users, but uh, you might have someone like a remote desktop user where it's connected from a remote desktop. Or you might have something like an IS user where it's uh, if you have a website running on your uh, server or on a Windows server, you might have some users that connect to manage that as well. All right, so here's the diagram. Uh, you can probably Google this image. It's like an operating system family tree. Family tree. So uh, here's MS-DOS and kind of uh, where Windows branched off and that's kind of its own thing. And then you have Unix and Unix, you can see Linux kernel was built from this Unix kernel plus GNU software, which basically kind of built the connection between the user and this kernel. And so it's kind of, yeah. And so you have a bunch of distributions like Debian, Ubuntu, Linux Mint, and you have things like Android or uh, Chrome operating system, like on your Chromebook and Arc Linux, which uh, one of our guys here uses. And we also have NEXT, and that was actually founded by Steve Jobs. So this is the operating system built by Steve Jobs, or not built by Steve, but Steve Jobs worked to create it. And it continued to kind of, it came from this Mac kernel and this Mac kernel combined with BSD kernel. So these are just various kernels you can Google up if you are interested, and that would form Mac OS and iOS. So you can kind of see how these are kind of related, but not really. And so Microsoft its own thing. And yeah, so there's a bunch of other distribution, or not distribution, a bunch of other operating systems. But I think that's it for operating systems. 
Uh, now we'll be moving on to uh, kernel vulnerabilities. And I think Zenkai will share on that. So yeah, to get into the set of, um, the set of security aspects of operating systems, we can talk about how, um, how the kernel, the core of the operating system can be you know, attacked. And so kernel vulnerabilities are basically bugs in the OS kernel, and they can be caused by um, negligent coding or bad designs or just, yeah. Um, um, and since the kernel is like, um, so since the kernel has a, like the highest privilege in the operating system, like it can do anything, um, if, if something goes wrong in the kernel, it, it can lead to like potentially severe consequences. So, so that this is why an attacker would like to, you know, try to look for kernel vulnerabilities and, and you know, uh, attack them in real life. Uh, security, security researchers are also like very um, like interested in securing this aspect of operating system as well because of its you know, danger. And one thing kernel vulnerabilities allows to allow you to do is privilege escalation. So imagine you're just a normal user. You can you can use you can use kernel vulnerabilities, and um, so some some of them allows you to escalate your privilege to say an uh, system administrator. So on on, uh, on Windows that would just be you know uh, NT authority slash system. On Linux you'll get uh, you'll get root the root user um, or get a root shell etc. And um, it's um, so kernel vulnerabilities because of the uh, because of the set reasons it's very sought after. All right, so uh, I think we'll go first into Windows kernel vulnerabilities. And so uh, there's a couple here. Uh, first one is Juicy Potato. And basically, uh, this is found a couple, uh, I think a year, around a year ago. Um, but it's basically this, actually, I'm not too sure on the date. But uh, it's built off a much more simple uh, rotten potato exploit. And that was kind of created by the same guy. But that was uh, Juicy Potato is like kind of a weaponized version of it. So the exploit. Uh, this exploit, you can actually just go from GitHub and there's like an exe file you can run and you can try uh, basically getting privileged or escalating to become an uh, NT authority. And uh, it goes from service account. Oh, this is kind of complicated, but uh, basically you go from a really base account that uh, that doesn't have much power. And uh, with this exploit, uh, it kind of fiddles around with this Kerberos service and an authentication service. And it is able to basically get full power of a computer. And this is kind of over, you can do it either over a network or locally on the computer. And so uh, the patch, the fix for this is, there really isn't a fix. The only fix there is, is to kind of protect your service accounts because that's where the exploit can be exploited from. And so, uh, yeah, it's kind of, this is kind of, uh, if your IT guy has a good network design and, and uh, enforces the correct policies, then this shouldn't happen. But um, yeah, so restricting the power of these kind of service accounts because something like this can happen. And so moving on, we have uh, CVEs. And what CVEs are, are basically uh, common vulnerabilities and exploits. That's what it stands for, CVE, common vulnerability exploit. And so uh, this first one's from 2020 recently, actually. And so this one, uh, you can also just search these up. There's a lot, if you search up Windows, kernel, you can even just search up CVEs and a lot of these will pop up. And CVEs don't have to be just operating systems. They can be things like uh, breaking into a, a website or uh, some kind of bug in some kind of programming language that's, uh, that's bad design or something like, you can have a Chrome browser CVE or you can crash a person's computer or something or like crash Chome. And so uh, CV, this CVE 2020-0796, it uses servage message block and servage server message block is basically this way to uh, share files across a local or a, a network. And so it spends, it sends basically, they actually don't give too much info on this because they don't want to like let you like, you know, break into their computer, but uh, it sends a special packet. And when the compression, uh, when you compress that file and to get sent and then it gets uncompressed, it uh, usually can, uh, you can run code on another computer. And so a uh, service message block, or also known as SMB, we're actually SMB v1. So this one's SMB v3, but SMB v1 was actually uh, what was used in the WannaCry attacks uh, a while ago. I think like 10, actually I'm not too, 2017? Or actually, I don't, I don't remember. 
2017, 2017? I don't know. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, so the first one was privilege escalation, which basically lets you gain unauthorized power access. Uh, and the remote co code execution is when you can run code on another computer without permissions. Or if you like illegally, illegally? Yeah. All right. And then you have CV 2019, 1347. So it was probably in 2019. And it's a denial of service uh, exploit where um, when, uh, wait, what is it? Okay. But I think it was running a, or when running a portable executable, so kind of just like us, portable executables, uh, like DL, like inside these are like EXEs and DLL files, if you guys know what that is, those, what those are. But uh, basically, when you have an executable file that you can send from another computer to another, like you, it's portable, uh, when you're trying to open it or parse it, your computer, basically, there's a, it's trying to parse it, and then it kind of, there's a vulnerability where it is reading the, it's like reading the code, reading the software, and then it goes to a point where it says, all right, you have to go read here, but then you're reading somewhere else outside of where it's supposed to be reading, and so that can uh, basically crash the target system and so it's kind of denial of service because then that server you're running or that computer you're running won't work anymore because it's down. All right. So yeah, those are uh, kernel, vulnerabilities. kernel vulnerabilities for Windows. I think Linux is up next. Um, okay. Uh, wait, I think I need to share. Um, Um, so yeah, um, next up we have um, Linux kernel vulnerabilities. And then, um, so we're gonna do a demo with this um, like relatively well-known, uh, relatively well-known well um, Linux kernel vulnerability called Dirty Cow or C-O-W. And it's, it's, a, a, it's a CVE as well. And it's uh, um, and it was reported in 2016. And in, um, so let me take you to the page. Wait. So yeah, so it, it affects like a lot of, so it, it, went, it went all the way back to Linux uh, kernel version, like two point something or three point something, or yeah, two point X through four point X. And um, yeah, so and right now we're in um, version 5.8 or or something. So yeah, it affects a lot of um, kernel versions. So this was pretty severe. And then, oh, so it, it was patched, but yeah. So, and uh, and then, so uh, what it does is, is that um, this this vulnerability, it, it, um, it is a race condition. So basically a race condition is when um, something, it, is when uh, something happens because of the timing of certain events. So in this case, this this certain event is um, copy on write. So so in Linux, um, when you have when you have um, some file that you want to read, um, what it does, what Linux does is that it copies it into the memory, and then if you want to uh, if you want to modify it, you basically just um, change the memory and then the Linux uh, uh, kernel operate, uh, like it automatically um, write it to the, um, the actual file. And then, but what if this, what if this file is not, is not writable? And what if we don't have the permission to do so? Then what it does is that uh, until, it, until it gets modified, it's just, it, it's just plainly uh, just copied into the memory. But if, when we want to write it, it makes a copy of that memory and then it duplicates it, and then it writes on the on our private copy instead. So we don't have access to the original. We don't have write access to the original copy, but we we have write access to the um, new copy. So we can write on that, and then maybe create a new file, whatever. But what what the kernel uh, what the kernel vulnerability lies is that, um, so, um, so in the copy on write process, there are two steps to it. So one step is when um, the kernel um, basically makes a cop um, makes a copy, and then the second step is when it wants it, it writes to that um, copy um, to that um, memory mapping. And so, um, if so, in the in the exploit, we have uh, uh, we have two threads, and they are uh, executed like in parallel, and then um, we 
we have two while loops. So basically they just do this repeatedly so that um, they can get the right timing and then um, exploit it. So the, the left side, uh, so basically we start by uh, reading in a, uh, by loading a read only file. Um, and then um, the next step we um, map it. We don't have to worry about that. Um, and then on the left side, the thread one, we repeatedly, um, we repeatedly write, try to write to this um, file, which um, so in normally it will just copy copy the memory mapping and then um, we'll have a like a private copy and then we don't so we 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 just can't modify this original file. But on the on the right side we um the this program uh, like tells the kernel hey we don't need this private mapping, and yeah so 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 when the timing is right. Um, this um, the kernel thought that we don't need the private mapping anymore, so just get rid of this, get rid of this, and then we what we have is the original copy. So the kernel gets fooled and it writes to this original copy instead, and this this caused the original the, like the read only file to be changed. So here is a visual representation. So originally we had this. Um, the exploit is on the right. Uh, it's on the left side. It's dirtycal.c. It's a C um, program, and then we have the kernel, and then we have some address space. Um, so the the program can um, like use this address space to um, to basically uh, write or read or write stuff, and then and then on the right side it's the actual like physical uh, memory. So so the this left side is the kernel's representation of this um, the physical memory. So Right now, on the physical memory, we have the original file, and then, and then the um, the program tells the kernel to create a mapping of this file to the like um, create a mapping in the uh, virtual address space. So basically, when it changes something in the virtual address space, if it has this mapping, it will automatically get reflected in the like the uh, original file, and then the kernel, um, and because of uh, because it's a read only file. Uh, uh, the kernel has to create a copy, but this is that it thinks that if it's not if if we haven't read uh, did any modification yet, then we don't have to copy it since it all it only wants to do is read, so we don't have to copy it yet. And so it just um, says that hey, there's your private mapping of this root file um, to this you know that this this is a like link to this uh, actual file, and then. And so what it what the program does is that on the left side it says, "Hey, I want to write uh, something something to this um, root file um, through this mapping." And then on the right side it, it says that um, uh, it says that we don't need this mapping anymore. And then the kernel takes it. The kernel take uh, kernel receives a request that it wants to write something, and then and then yeah. So when it thinks, hey, what do I want to write? Yeah, and then it points there, and then it knows that, hey, I actually want to uh, create a uh, like an actual mapping, so create an actual copy of this root file because we don't have permission to it. So, so the other thread, the other thread that is uh, saying that we don't need the private mapping anymore, um, fools the kernel and. Uh, and the kernel just get rid of that private mapping because uh, it's ne negligent coding, remember? Uh, so, and then it just says, oh, I think we should actually write to the original file instead. And then it takes the file content and write it to the original file, which is not supposed to be allowed, but the kernel gets fooled. So that's what happens. So I don't think we don't, I don't think we have enough time, but if you're interested, you can, you know, remain and then I can maybe do a demo. So what we, ha what we have here is the um, Try Hack Me. It's a cool website. It has a lot of, um, basically, you can connect to the machines on this website and then you can like just hack stuff. And uh, let's deploy, oh, since I haven't logged in yet. And uh, 
Hmm. Okay, let's deploy the machine. Okay, so. Um, okay, let's let me co connect to the um, try hacking network through VPN. Okay, we don't have to worry about that anymore. We're connected. Okay, let me. Um, all right. So um, while we wait for the uh, uh, the machine to get like init initialized, we can. Um, so so basically, this is a machine that's like designed to be exploited, to be attacked, and we should be able to get root access very easily because it has like literally a ton of vulnerabilities that you know that can be they can take uh, advantage of. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the dirty cloud exploit. So well, we already have a normal user um, with the password, I mean, with the, uh, the username user and the password password 321. So we can use that to log into the machine remotely. Okay, we can just copy that. Let me, um, let me, uh, okay. So we can SSH into that machine. Oh shit, I forgot to specify that. Um, and then we type in the password. It's concealed, so it, it doesn't show you that, that you type the password, but that's how Linux does things because you don't want other people to see the length of your password. Okay, we've logged in. And so this, this uh, machine conveniently, very conveniently provides the source code of this exploit in the machine. So we can just literally just compile it. So, yeah. So the GCC, um, GCC is a like C or C++ compiler, and then um, we we can use it to compile the um, the C source code, and we can specify the dash p thread option to enable like multi uh, like threading. So we can use these two threads to you know get the right timing for these for the dirty cow attack. And then the dash O C C zero W is just used to specify the name of the output um, file, the executable. And now we just we can use um, dot slash uh, C O W dot slash meaning the current directory. Um, so we can use that to execute this file. And what it does is that it makes use of this dirty cow vulnerability, and then it tries to write um, like malicious count content to a like a special executable called password. So the, this program is originally intended to change user password. And then um, to do that, it needs like root privileges. So, but um, this is not, so if, if, it, if the password program functions correctly, then it, it should only like change the password and do nothing else. But if we change the file content to another executable, then it also has, then it can do like malicious stuff like start a root shell, which is what this thing does. So, so, so before that, we can run password, and then it just shows you, uh, hey, what what's, um, what your current password is, because you want to change the password, you have to prove your identity, and we don't want to do that. So um, we can run this um, dirty cow program to try to exploit it, and then we'll wait for a few seconds. We'll wait for uh, a minute or two, actually, because it takes time to get to, to get the right timing so that the uh, the right side um, of the the the, uh, the right thread um, basically the that thread tells the um, the kernel that we don't need this private mapping anymore so so we need um, to wait some time to for for that thread to get into the middle of the um, the um, the copying and the writing. Um, it won't actually output anything. Um, so we'll just have to wait a few. Okay, I think let's try if this works. Wait, Senkai, uh, Peter asked, so dirty cow is just a vulnerability? 
Um, so yeah, dirty cow is a vulnerability, and then people have come, came up with an exploit for it. So an exploit is where you, see you can, so it's a, it's a program or something that you can use to like take advantage, take advantage of this vulnerability and then get, do something like malicious. So also, oh, sorry, uh, I think it's interesting to point out that since this runs on older versions of Linux and this works in those versions, if like some company or organization didn't update their, uh, their, their computers and such, you can actually use this to get their information. Yeah, 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 that's true. So but you, you should not because that's unethical <laughs> yeah. and we're not liable. So you can you can you should only do this on like in authorized circumstances like in chat hack me is allowed because they're literally letting you hack but um, in other circumstances um, of, even though you have discovery that their kernel version is old or like not updated or something you should not like use it you can you can email them <laughs> so yeah so as you can see before the exploit the password um, um, the password utility is only a password is only a utility for changing password. But now, if I run password, that's been changed to a root shell. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. So right now we can do, we can do interesting stuff. Like if I, if I do ID, you can you can find that I'm root now. So I can do all kinds of stuff like installing packages. Should I can type today. Okay, uh, it doesn't have. What? Have to get? Yeah. Okay. So like, if if I'm root, if I'm root, I can install programs and stuff. And then, well, we don't have to do that because it's already installed. Uh, and since we want to, since since we want to like restore the system, we have to put um, the backup that the program made back into place. So I have to like like change. So I have to rename it tmp slash back to a user bin password to, to override the um, exploited binary. And then we have to change the, change the owner of the binary back to root. Wait, I think it's, yeah, yeah, because the, the backup was like made by the original normal user. So I have to change it. Shown root, root. In password and then mod. Um, okay, so yeah, as as you can see, um, so, uh, uh, okay, the last point I will cover is that these kernel vulnerabilities, especially especially with this race condition, is like it can it can make the kernel very unstable. So, make sure you want make sure you restore the OS like. Um, after you exploited it. So either because you don't want anyone to notice that you did bad things or just, you know, keep the system, you know, running as normal. Yeah, so that's it. Okay, so. Hmm. I really have 11 people left, but like 20 people. But um, yeah, so we're basically done. Um, you guys, you guys can contact us here if you guys have any questions. We'll stay a while uh, for to answer them. And yeah, that's basically it for today's lesson.